Hi, I'm Jim Ferguson, and in my radio career, I've had the opportunity to do many things. One of the biggest highlights was being production director for WHS Radio, a 50,000-watt clear channel broadcast station in Louisville, Kentucky. I was production director from 1970 to 1979, and during that time, I was given almost full reign to produce whatever radio shows I might be interested in producing. Can you imagine that? Whatever I could envision. And they were paying me for this. Well, actually, I could produce anything I wanted to in addition to my regular production schedule and my weekend radio show. But still, the near total freedom to explore all the possibilities and get it on the air. I could do this because I won many awards along the way. And it was like each award said, you're good to go, buddy. Keep on keeping on. It said that to me, but more important, that was also said to my boss, Mr. Hugh Barr, who was the station general manager and a very nice person to work with. I think he hired me because he thought I was creative and knowledgeable in broadcast electronics. Without going into too much detail here, the station was having growing pains, moving away from old radio engineer-only operated equipment to a modern jock-operated audio board known as Combo. So this involved all the engineers, their unions, and the announcers, and their union. In addition to on-air combo, he wanted the production people to be able to operate their own equipment. I didn't envy his position. It was like trying to pull two large mountains together with a lasso. And I was part of that lasso. He knew I was thoroughly capable of operating my own production equipment. He also knew that I knew pretty much everything the engineers knew so I could talk turkey with them instead of getting a technical snow job. No more maintenance slips in the general inter-office mail. They would now be hand-delivered downstairs to maintenance immediately. Long story short, I was the canary in the cave, but I carried a shotgun, the station manager's backing. So if you want to just get to the high points, start at 1970. If you're interested in how I got there, just let it roll. But keep in mind, this is an interactive PC DVD. So move it along at your interest rate. You're the editor. All you have to do is hit next when needed. Thank you. Radio, the beginning. Radio began long before any of us were born. The frequencies that radio uses to operate on are as old as Alpha, the beginning of this universe. It took man many years to learn how to use those frequencies to make radio signals. In the very beginning of radio, he didn't even know how to transmit his own voice. He was reduced to dots and dashes. He wrote a letter code made up of those dots and dashes. It was called the Morse code. It was used first on telegraph lines, strung along poles from coast to coast and under the ocean around the world. Then that code was embraced by radio as its main form of communication. Radio became the newer telegraph. The main difference between them was that radio didn't need wires to transmit from point A to point B. Radio could go instantly around the world from point A through Z and all points in between instantly. Throughout the world and the universe, these radio signals traveled and would tell of many stories of distress and drama, joy and triumph, major news events in progress. Radio was found to be indispensable. Most all ships and planes had wireless telegraph sets. But there were many who knew that radio could be so much more than dots and dashes, and they spent hours and hours, months and years, unlocking the possibilities of transmitting the human voice through the air. Man's essence teleported to all parts of the world, while he stood in just one small micron of space. And yes, at some point, in some experiment, voice was sent successfully wirelessly. It was crude, the voice very distorted, sounding more like static than human, but the voice was controlling the static. From there on, it was a race to improve the quality. Man had achieved one of the greatest dreams of civilization, wireless transmission of the human voice. The very first voice signals on the air were limited. It was called push to talk. The mic had a push button switch on it. You listened, then pushed the button to talk. Transmissions were short and to the point. But somehow, as time passed, 
it seemed like radio kept showing up at more major world events. Major news stories started coming in by radio first. It would be hours, if not days, before newspapers would have it. And so the commercialization of radio continued. Broadcast stations now began to proliferate in major cities. These were much more than push-to-talk transmissions. These stations were on the air for hours and hours at a time, relaying the news of the day from around the world. The effect was magnetic in the truest sense of the word. By the time I was born in 1944, radio already had a long history of achievements. It now proudly stood its vigil, like a watchdog in the night, to warn others of approaching danger. And then, it began to entertain the listening audience between the disasters and warnings. Yes, push to talk was gone. These babies were cooking. Music on radio was now commonplace, and people loved it. It was mesmerizing. People were connected to people around the world. And we found out that some people were very different than us. Radio was tremendous at painting visual word pictures. The first and the get it started, get it started. It's right, it's right, it's right, it's terrible. Oh, it could take you there in an instant, wherever there happened to be. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin from CBS World News. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. Radio just connected you to your town, to your state, to your country to the world and beyond. Well, maybe now we are getting ahead of the story. So much for the radio overview. Let's get on with my radio dreams. Here are some basic facts we'll be dealing with in detail. I was bitten by the radio bug by six years old. My grandfather had been bitten by the same bug, and he helped me discover how to scratch it. I was radio broadcasting throughout the local neighborhood by 12. And you'll have a front row seat following the adventure, from 5 watts to 50,000 watts. And it's all documented on tape. This is a one-of-a-kind interactive documentary, which has taken a lifetime to produce. And it's dedicated to all children everywhere who have radio dreams. This is Jim Ferguson's Radio Dreams a documentary that encompasses some 50 hours of material, making it one of the world's longest documentaries. With audio recordings dating back to 1956, when I was a 12-year-old kid, nursing one of the worst cases of radio bug bite ever known to mankind. But my story really begins a lot earlier than that. I mean, I just didn't fall out of the sky as a 12-year-old. I was raised in the country in West Palm Beach, Florida, a few miles out of town. The earliest thing I remember was my grandfather and grandmother coming to live with us when I was six or seven. A few days before they arrived, my family, my father and mother and sister and brother, were hard at work packing up things in the garage and putting them into cardboard boxes. We stacked and we piled and that wall of boxes climbed toward the garage ceiling. To hide all those boxes, we hung a cloth blanket to make a wall. The garage side door now became this small apartment's front door, which opened onto a breezeway that was about 15 feet wide and connected the main house to the garage. The next thing I remember was that my grandfather had built a garden area a good walk from the main house. This specific area had been chosen because of the heavy black muck soil, ideal for growing. He grew corn, potatoes, many varieties of tomatoes, and flowers. He wore khaki pants and a khaki shirt every day, with just a scrub of facial hair. He was slightly heavyset and soft-spoken. In the garden, he had a small work table, but the main thing was a homemade windmill. It was impressive, a 30-foot tall wooden tower with this airplane thing with big steel blades and an airplane-like tail. Sometimes when the wind really blew hard, I thought it would take off. The windmill furnished water for the garden. There were no power lines to run a pump. There was also another building in the garden area. It was a glass house. Well, to a seven-year-old, that's what it looked like. Actually, it was a large storage shed made out of large window frames on all sides. 
It was maybe 10 feet by 10 feet, with a rainproof roof and glass on all sides. This was my grandfather's storage shed, with more cardboard boxes stacked to the ceiling in some areas. As I said, this was my grandfather's stuff, and some of his stuff was magic. He went to this garden every morning at 8 o'clock. He would come home for lunch and then back to the garden till 5 o'clock. I remember there were occasions when he would have to go looking for things in the glass shed. And if I were lucky enough to be in the area, I would be right there by his side as he searched. Somehow it didn't usually matter what he was looking for. I knew that there were two or three boxes of stuff in there that were pure magic, filled with all kinds of radio and telephone parts, parts from another time, parts that held secrets. How did they work? Old telephone headsets and microphones, dials and coils, tubes, some of the biggest radio tubes I'd ever seen. I can't really express the depth of my attraction to these things, but my grandfather understood because these were his things and he had thought enough of them to pack them away, to save them. And when he would open one of these boxes, it was to me like being a pirate opening a lost buried treasure chest. I'm sure my eyes were as big as saucers and probably glazed over at the same time. I don't mean to make this a big deal, but it was. And I know that he knew it was, because he would always find just that right item to give to me. I was as much like him, I guess, as he was. That old telephone headset, or whatever radio part it was he gave me, would turn into hours, weeks, and months of experimenting, wiring it in different ways. Which way worked best? Where do you put the battery? This went on every four or five months for two to three years. I was constantly amazed by the stuff he had, and the stuff that he gave me. He passed away in the garden, and I missed him. I didn't go to his funeral. It took a while to put everything into perspective. But life does go on. He had wanted me to have those three boxes of magic when he passed. And in fact, that's what happened. And I played with and experimented with all that stuff for two or three years. I missed those times with him in the garden. But his gifts helped. It was like a part of him still was there, his essence. In retrospect, he lived on inside of me. I say all this just to let you know what kind of kid I was by the time I was 12, and our story begins with my first audio recordings. And just a suggestion on how you might listen to this production. The commentaries describe the upcoming segments. So play each commentary, then begin playing the described segment. Some segments are longer than others. So remember, this is interactive. Just advance to the next commentary.